It should be a revelation that we start to do the work that the Father's given us to do. And that work is not to tear each other down when we see a defect, but to build each other up. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll begin our meeting. Father in heaven, we come before you again this evening and we thank you for putting it on our hearts to be in search of you. And Father, as we do that here together, we ask that you would be with us. May your spirit lead us and guide us this evening. May you cleanse our hearts that you can truly dwell in us that you may teach us your ways. We ask this in Yeshua's name, amen. So what, um, so let's pick up from where we were last week. Does anyone remember what we were talking about last week? We were talking about the typology of the feasts. Remember? Oh yeah, we yes. remember. So we talked about Passover. Okay, yeah, good. We talked about Passover. So each one of the feasts points forward to something, something of a greater magnitude. So the very simplest one would be uh, when John stood up and proclaimed that Yeshua was the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. This 1,500-year-old thing that the, the Jewish people, actually 2,000 if you want to count back to Abraham, uh, Abraham was given the picture the father of the Jewish nation, of the sacrifice of the Messiah when he went to Mount Moriah, which was exactly the spot uh, of that temple in Yeshua's day. So we see this prophecy unfolding 2,000 years before Yeshua when the father of the Jewish nation was asked to sacrifice his son, and that was the test. And many people think, well, that was just a test to, just to prove uh, prove that Abraham was, was you know, going to be God's man. But actually, it was proof of something far greater than that. It was a comparison, if you will, that the father, the father of all, was willing to sacrifice his son to provide atonement for the sins of the whole world. So Abraham would have to accept what the father was doing and for the father to prove Abraham, God knew what Abraham was going to do, but the proving was far greater than that. The proving were, was not only for those of us in the world that would read this, with this later, but we, all, we always seem to forget about the unseen world, the, the angels at the very least. This was a test that demonstrated to the angels that Abraham was worthy of responsibility. He was willing to go all the way with the father and sacrifice his son. So any of you that have children, I know, I'm pretty sure, that any of you that have children would rather, if your son was going to die or your daughter was going to die, you would step in the breach and save them and you would, you would take the brunt of, of the uh, suffering. I know that. That's what a parent does. They would do that. They hate to see their kids suffer and they would much rather go through it themselves. Well, this was, this was the magnitude of the, the scale of events. We don't always think about that. But this test for Abraham was to demonstrate that he would go all the way with the father and he was worthy to be the father of the uh, Israelite nation because he was willing to go all the way the same the father was going to go all the way with his son. And, and so this was a test, but it was also a prophecy of the promised Messiah and what the father was going to do in the sacrifice of his son. So, but we see the, the, really the bottom line here is, 
is that God provided a sacrifice. So when John comes along, he says, behold the Lamb of God. Well, back 2,000 years ago, Abraham proclaimed in Genesis 22 that God would provide a sacrifice on Mount Moriah. And uh, you can read about that in Genesis 22. So that was confirmation that God would provide a sacrifice on that same place, which he did 2,000 years later, the promised Messiah. The son of promise would finally come, uh, as in Isaac would finally come. The promise of Isaac would, took time, 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 time. And, uh, and Sarah was almost, well, she was past the bear of, uh, bearing of children. So they waited till the nth degree, if you will, the same way that Israel did as well. So the promised seed came as the Lamb of God, and John recognized it. So this is, this is probably the simplest uh, typology that the Bible has. You've got a four-legged beast, and we go all the back, way back to Eden, where in the book of Revelation, chapter 13, verse 10, I believe it is, says that Yeshua was the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So that's the type, the one, the very first Lamb that was slain. We talked about that last week. That lamb was slain, and it pointed forward to the lamb of God that would come. Also, in uh, the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul talks about Yeshua being our Passover. So we have the Passover sacrifice is a type of Yeshua coming. And then we can go back to the Exodus and see how that was all played out there. And they were delivered at that time. So we looked at the concept, the idea, and for anyone that hasn't seen last week's, they might want to go back and, and see that. We talked about the idea that now people are on to this thing about types and antitypes with the, with the uh, festivals. And we, have, we still have uh, Pentecost, Trumpets, and Day of Atonement, and Tabernacles. All those point forward to something different than Passover. So each one basically is going to be a pinnacle event in the plan of salvation. So we need to go back and see the, the groundwork or the foundation of the type back in the beginning and see what it is pointing forward to. So we looked at the Passover and saw in the Passover that it was a deliverance from bondage, number one. Uh, the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world became the Passover lamb that was slain in Yeshua. Yeshua becomes now our high priest and he intercedes for us. That's another type in the sanctuary. The, the priestly system back then pointed forward to Yeshua. So all of these things are a, and I don't want to discredit or, or uh, make of none effect the sanctuary and what happened back then, but we can look at it sort of like a sandbox thing. When we were children, God was teaching us something in that sandbox that was going to point forward to some greater events. So our job here at the end of the world is to learn those lessons from the past, how the Jewish people got it wrong, didn't understand not only the prophecies, but the typology of the sanctuary. Uh, that's why they ran back home to, to slay their lamb and to get their lamb all ready when, when the lamb of God was actually hanging on the cross. And, and we see that so clearly back there. So they missed it because they missed the sanctuary types, what it was pointing forward to. So we don't want to make that mistake. We want to learn that lesson from the past. And that's why we're going through this. And I think it will ultimately benefit us because we're going to know what's coming before it does, not only with the prophecies, but with the sanctuary, because it's a blending of the two. Yeshua fulfilled Isaiah 53, and uh, that talks about the one that was slain, uh, uh, like a lamb led to the slaughter. He also fulfilled the prophetic uh, mission of the Messiah as well as prophesied in Daniel chapter 9. So we see prophecy and typology coming together in the fulfillment of the first coming, we should learn from that that this is going to be happening at the second coming as well. 
I would, I would dare say that the typology at the second coming is going to be far more critical and important, and here's why. Many people think that after Yeshua returns, there's going to be some kind of second chance, if you will. I call that a rapture theory. And, when I, and don't get confused when I say a rapture theory. We all know what the rapture theory is. That's being taken up or caught up before the seven-year tribulation, which uh, another day we might spend some time on that, but I believe that is totally false. Um, God would have changed the way he's worked from the very beginning. He never takes his people out of tribulation. He protects them through it. So that's just the way it's always worked, and that's the way it will work. So, but when I say a rapture theory, there's another rapture theory, and all a rapture theory is a, is a second chance for some people that didn't want to go all the way or didn't believe fully. And when they see their loved ones, so they think, when they see their loved ones uh, taken up and their clothes are laying on the ground and they've been taken, then they're going to get serious about their faith because that's their second chance. You see, people aren't finished, quite finished with the world and they are going to wait for their second chance. Well, in the, in the millennial teaching, there is a second chance theory as well. And that is that if you didn't get an opportunity to hear the truth in this life, then you're going to be woken up. And if you die, then you're going to be woken up and get to go through the millennium and you'll have your opportunity to choose salvation through there. Uh, both of these are lies uh, of the devil. And what they are lies about is you don't have to choose your salvation today. You can actually put it off to tomorrow. Any teaching that allows you to put off the day of salvation to tomorrow uh, is of the devil. No question about it. Paul says today is the day of salvation. Today is when we need to make that decision. So the typology, the reason why I said what I said a few minutes ago, that means that typology is very important for us to get it straight now before Yeshua returns. And here's why. At the first coming, it wasn't as critical because there was salvation. If you rejected, if you were the ones that were yelling, crucify him, crucify him, if you somehow realized after that point that Yeshua was the Lamb of God and I need to accept him, there was salvation after that. But when deliverance comes, when Yeshua returns, salvation is closed. There's no more uh, salvation. We have to make our decisions prior to his second coming. And that's why, that's why I believe, and that's how we're going to show, that's how we'll demonstrate that it's very critical for us to learn the lesson of the past and get it straight today so we don't fall into the deception traps that are set all around us. And if we ever think that we've gone past the point of being deceived, uh, that's proof that we are deceived. That's j it's just that way. We've always got to be uh, in, re in the reality check and realize that we are not past the point of no return. So we can go back to where we want to or where we've been in deception. It's just one choice away. So we're looking down here. Uh, we're talking about the Passover. And we did talk a little bit about uh, one of the reasons why people do not look at Passover as far as a, an end time scenario, because many people believed and have been taught in Christian churches that all the feasts were done away with at the cross. We don't need to celebrate them uh, anymore. So uh, then people were teaching also that it was very obvious that the Passover had been fulfilled and so, therefore, we only have the fall feasts uh, to really study out and, and look at the final fulfillments of them. But this flies right in the face of what Yeshua said when he uh, proclaimed at Passover. He says, I will no longer eat of this Passover or it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So for the words of Yeshua, if we're following Yeshua, we know for sure that the Passover has at least one more fulfillment down in the future. And he said, in the kingdom of God. So we looked at the concept 
of the Passover, uh, fitting quite nicely with the Egyptian exodus. Not only they had to have the slain lamb covering the doorpost, which really represent, that's, a, that's actually a type. You see, we have doorposts as well. Our forehead, which would be the lentil, and our hands, our shoulders down. Those are the doorposts. That's what we guard our heart with. So if we are anointed with the blood of the lamb on our sides and on our forehead, you see, that's the mark of God. That's the seal of God right there. Is our foreheads are marked? What does it say in Revelation? That God has a mark that he puts in our forehead. The enemy has a mark that he puts on our forehead uh, and on our hands. And God also has a mark, and it's a true mark. And it is also on our forehead and our hands. And the reason why it's our hands is because that's the work that we do. So Satan has marks that he puts in God's mind. He, he changes the way we think, Satan does, and it comes out in our works. You'll know them by their works. God has a mark that he puts in our mind. He changes our minds by the information that we put in there, uh, his holy word. And that changes the way we think, and it also changes the way we do things. And that's really what the blood uh, on the lentils and, and on the doorpost was really representing. It was the entrance to our dwelling where God wants to dwell. So this all is Passover typology. It also points forward to down at the end of time when we get our ultimate deliverer comes and we have accepted the blood of the lamb. It's been applied to our foreheads and uh, our doorposts. And we have given him entrance and not the destroyer. So the Passover, the typology from Egypt, we saw some similarities from Sodom. We saw Noah, very possibly. Uh, Noah was delivered at the second Passover. Methuselah died at the year of the flood. Very likely, Methuselah was not uh, fit to celebrate the Passover. Uh, he was at least preparing for a long journey, filling up the ark. When you said Methuselah, then you meant Noah. Noah uh, was not fit for Passover. Yeah, Noah. Yeah, Methuselah wouldn't have been fit for Passover either. He was passed away. Um, but anyways, uh, Noah wouldn't have been fit according to Torah. Uh, and so he wouldn't have been able to celebrate Passover very likely. He was also preparing for a long journey, filling up the ark with food and all kinds of things. And it seems that he went into the ark, according to the word, uh, in the second month, right at Passover time. So we see typology. Yeshua said of Sodom and Gomorrah and of Noah, he said it would be as in the days of Noah and in the days of Lot. So often we're thinking of just the evilness of the world, but I would propose that there may be more to it than just the evil of the world. The timing may play into this as well. And we saw that Eve, uh, the, the transgression of Adam and Eve, uh, caused the lamb to be slain. They were given skins to wear. Uh, and then we saw Luke, we, what we were quoting in Luke, when Yeshua said, I will no longer eat of it until, speaking of the Passover, until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So we know the Passover will be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And we talked about the concept, if we are delivered at Passover, and we're going to see this, we're going to try and prove this so solidly that you won't be able to miss it. And right now it might be a little bit foggy, but we're going we're gonna to try and clear this up as we go because once we start applying prophecy in here, that's the proof, in my mind, that's the proof that all of this is true. Just using the sanctuary is not enough. We've got to apply prophecy as well, and prophecy is, the, is when you double down on whether this is true or not. We're going to get there. We're going to get there. So we're looking at concepts. The one thing that I, I forgot last week that I want to uh, mention here is in Revelation, it talks about the marriage supper of the Lamb. So my, I would propose 
that when it talks about the marriage supper of the Lamb, if we are going to be delivered at Passover, and I'm going to try and prove that, that we will be delivered at Passover, but we will be unable to keep the Passover here in this world, and Yeshua is going to come, and he said, when I come, I will take you to where I am, take you to the Father's house, and that's where we will celebrate the Passover. That's exactly what Yeshua said, in the kingdom of God. That is not here on this earth. That is where God's throne is. And we all know that Yeshua said that I'm going away. I will come again and receive you and take you to the Father's house. So that's what Yeshua was talking about at the last Passover that he shared with his disciples. Is that's when he would come back and take us to the Father's house. And that's when we would celebrate that great Passover that he spoke about at his last Passover. And I believe, because he's going to show up on time, as he delivered them from Egypt, but he's going to take us, and we will be able to celebrate the Passover in the second month. And I believe, primarily, that God obviously knows the end from the beginning, knew that at the end, when he rescued his elect from the four corners of the earth, that he will take them to the Father's house after that, because they would not be able to celebrate the Passover at that time, uh, because they would very likely be unclean, because they've been in contact with dead bodies, if I'm reading Revelation correctly, very likely with dead bodies, and also they will be fleeing for their lives at that point. So they will have, uh, they will be qualified to keep it in the second month, and they'll do that in the Father's house. So, and that's the typology of the feast. You can't, you can't deny that. That's just uh, the typology. And then once we get to the kingdom of God, we will be in a state of unleavened, not only within our own bodies, but even the presence of sin. That's what the unleavened feast was all about. Even the presence. We were supposed to discard the presence. You guys have probably celebrated the Passover to, uh, before. Uh, what we used to do, and we had these gatherings with, you know, people with kids, families with kids and stuff, we would have little uh, sweeping things, and we'd go around, and we'd lay a couple crumbs here and there for bread, and the kids would go around and, and try and find the leaven in the house. That's, that po is pointing forward to, one day, there will be no leaven in our houses. And I'm not talking bread now. We know what leaven uh, represents, and it represents sin. also represents the kingdom of heaven, and that's sort of a big contrast. Uh, but in the context of the Passover, the leaven is, is put out, and, and we're clean, and that's talking about sin. So ultimately, it's not just the removal of sin from our lives, but it's the removal of even the presence of sin all around us. And so when we go to the Father's house, we are going to be in the presence of holiness everywhere. And, and then the, the fulfillment of that feast will be manifest. Uh, we will be removed from all leaven and we will celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which I believe to be the marriage supper of the Lamb. And... Um, it's interesting that the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread is the only feast that has, according to Torah, a special meal attached to it. Now, that doesn't mean they didn't eat at any of the other feasts, but we can't miss the point. This was the only feast that had a special meal that went, through, went with it. And it was an unleavened uh, meal, which means the removal of all sin. Not only inside, but outside as well. This is, a, this is a kingdom feast. That's what that is pointing forward to. Uh, Revelation 19 tells us that uh, the marriage supper of the Lamb has come just prior to Yeshua returning, uh, meaning that it's time for him to come back, receive his bride, and all those that have been raised, and they will go and celebrate the marriage supper of the Lamb at the Father's house for seven days. That's how long the celebration will be uh, in the second month. It's very interesting that in the Torah, according to the Torah, if you miss the Passover in the first month, 
you have to keep it identically all through the second month. So the seven-day feast, you know, everyone says, oh, it's got to be tabernacles, it's got to be tabernacles, because it's a seven-day feast. Well, wait a minute. Passover has a seven-day feast as well, and that will be the celebration that Yeshua uh, was pointing forward to at the um, Passover. Interesting, he pointed forward to it at Passover, showing that it will be a Passover that he's celebrating at the Father's house. Okay, so Pentecost. We'll, we'll leave the Passover for now. First fruits? Uh, well, first fruits, yeah, we talked about that. First fruits is the resurrection. The only feast that I'm aware of that has a resurrection attached to it. Now, if we're looking at types, remember, a lamb that was slain, became Yeshua that was slain. So we see the type in the lamb, the fulfillment in Yeshua. We see the type in the first fruits of the resurrection of Yeshua and those that were raised after his resurrection, according to Matthew 27, around 50, 51, 52, somewhere in there, talks about after Yeshua came out of his grave, after the resurrection, uh, he went and resurrected. It says many, and when you look at the typology, it would make a lot of sense that they left, when he left back to the fathers, he presented them as his first fruits in the, the uh, stage right here that was set uh, as the priest was going to the temple in Jerusalem with their... Um, sheaf of, of barley, Yeshua was taking his sheaf of what it pointed forward to, the type in the barley sheaf points forward to the resurrection that Yeshua did, that was his first fruits that he took to the Father's house when he ascended. Um, that also becomes a type for the final resurrection. This first fruits harvest that Yeshua made at his first coming is a type, not only in kind, but in time. That's how the types work. It's not just any old time. If we have a type, it has to be fulfilled when the type was done, which was at the Passover uh, during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So the resurrection will happen on time because Yeshua is going to return on time. We can't keep it on time, but he will return on time and he will resurrect those and at that point take them to the Father's house. And this is what it says in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16. Um, the Lord will descend with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air to meet the Lord in the air. And I say he meets us all in the air because that's our rendezvous point before we go to the Father's house. We're all going together to the Father's house. That's the beauty of it. Okay, so that's first fruits. Also, only feast that has a resurrection tied to it, pointing forward to our resurrection at the end of time. Showing again, I believe, that the uh, Passover will be fulfilled in our second coming when our deliverer comes and delivers us and the wicked, it says, are destroyed uh, when he comes as well. So he's doing exactly the same thing as happened back in Egypt. The same scenario is being played out. Egypt, actually the greater Egypt picture we see back uh, 13, 1400 years ago, or not that long now, but that time before Yeshua, when they left Egypt, that whole scenario, that whole Passover deliverance, right from the, from the first plague that fell, this is all typology. These are all typical of the greater exodus that's coming in Revelation, even to the, to the pouring out of the plagues. Uh, and we'll, uh, we'll look at that as well. Okay, so, so we see there, so Pentecost. So let's have some, uh, we, wanna, we want you to be able to take your, your um, mutes off now. I want to get some feedback. So we just sort of brought you up to speed here. 
So we're looking at Pentecost. What, um, what would we be looking at for a possible fulfillment of some kind of Pentecost in the future? What do we have in Scripture that would point to something that's still yet to, to happen, more of a pinnacle event than something that's happened at a Pentecost in the past? Let's have some ideas out there. Looking for ideas. Okay, all you scholars, I know you've thought about this before. I asked them what it was in the time of Exodus, what it was in the time Was of there Jesus. anything back in the time of the Israelites that might point to some kind of Pentecost typology? No? Yeah. Okay. So the the Israelites came out of um, Egypt at the time of the Passover, and we're told that it was, I believe, in the third month when they arrived at Sinai. And during the third month, what feast happens at the third month? Isn't that Exodus Pentecost? 19. Exodus 19. Turn to Exodus 19. 19 one, uh, yeah, the, in the third month after the Israelites went out from the land of Egypt on the very day, they came to the desert of Sinai. Okay. Wow. Could be a typology of a future event. Right, right. Okay, so go down in verse 3. And, and Moses went up to God, and, and Jehovah called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a pre special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom. This is very interesting here. You shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. Okay, so we see that God was actually making a covenant with the people of Israel back then. And remember, this whole thing that happened in Egypt was a type of the final deliverance. So God picked Pentecost to make a covenant with his people, and they were to obey him. Now, this is quite interesting, because has anyone tried to obey God before? How does, how does it work for you? Does it work pretty good? Does it work 100% of the time, or, or what? Yeah, so, so you lose your temper, temper and you start screaming at your kids and your wife and all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm just sort of over-exaggerating here. But we all know that. We fall, right? So ultimately, if we're going to celebrate this feast, it's this one that prepares us. So what happened was, is God came down on the mountain that was burning with fire and made a covenant with his people that they were going to obey him. Is it possible to obey God without the Spirit of God? No. 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 Ezekiel tells us, Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26 and 27, I believe it is, tells us that God would put a new spirit within us and he would remove our hearts of stone and put a new spirit within us to cause us to do something, to cause us to obey, to walk in his statutes and judgments and do them. That's what he wants to do. So that's very interesting that he picked Pentecost to do that. I would propose 
that we've got a Pentecost ahead of us where God is going to do exactly the same thing. He's not going to come down on Mount Sinai, per se, somewhere in the wilderness, over there on the other side of the world. He's going to come down into our hearts, which he is doing right now. You guys have all experienced this. This is the Spirit of God that we've all experienced that is causing us to walk in his statutes and judgments and do them. We're going, when the outpouring, when the full outpouring of the Spirit comes, it's going to enable us to be unleavened. We've got promises in the Word that we will never more turn our backs on God. We will never forsake Him. We will never sin, if you will. And that's future. For me, that's future. I can speak for myself. Maybe, maybe, you're, not, maybe you're already there. But God's plan for our lives is to take us from way down here, so to speak, and get us up to here, the unleavened part. That's a process. And he takes us from one stage, from one stage of grace to, to the next, to the next, to the next. We're being sanctified, if you will. We're set apart for a holy, holy use. That's what the word sanctified means. And that's what he wants to do. But ultimately, we need, we need not to be half filled with the Spirit. We need to have a full measure of the Spirit. Do we have any indication in the Bible in any types where we know that God's Spirit will be poured out without measure in the fullness? Is there anywhere in the Bible where we see somewhere where God's Spirit filled someone? Anywhere? What about in the upper room? Okay, good. When did that happen? Um, that was after Yeshua was crucified and, and he had told them prior to wait until, right, on Pentecost, but to wait. And also, they not only received, but all the people that were outside the, uh, the building that they were in, they, they also heard and, right. and were received. They, they felt the effect of the Spirit of God coming upon the disciples, the 120 that were in the upper room. And, yes. and what, is it, what does it say there? What Didn't it say that cloven tongues as of fire came upon? There was a rushing mighty wind? That sounds a lot. You want to go back to the Exodus story. You want to read that story. Um, those people were quaking in their boots, you might say, uh, because the presence of God showed up. This is the the same type of thing that happened in the upper room, uh, the promise of the Father. So it's very interesting here that at the Pentecost of the disciples, it was the Spirit, but when we go back to Egypt, it was the law. So you put Egypt and this together, and you've got an outpouring of the Spirit so that we can keep the law that he gave at Sinai. And to Tom, prepare us for this experience here. It's all for a purpose. Everything that God does is for a purpose and to teach us something. Judy, you were going to say something. Yes, I've had something I've been wanting to say for a little bit. And then Christopher has his hand raised, so he'll be right after okay. me. But in Exodus chapter 19, verse 1, I've had people look at this and say, well, that can't possibly be Pentecost because... They came out of the land of Egypt on the 15th day of the month, and Pentecost in the third month has to be between the 6th and 12th day of the month. And this is one of those verses in Scripture that needs some parentheses and some better understanding. In the third month, and then I have a parenthesis, after the children of Israel, Israel have gone out of the land of Egypt, on the same day they came to the wilderness of Sinai, so instead of saying in the third month after the children came on the same day that they came out of Egypt, I believe what this is saying. It was on the third month on New Moon Day. On the third month, on the same day they came to the wilderness of Sinai, Moses went up to God, verse 3, 
And the Lord called him and told him to sanctify yourself. You've got three days. Prepare everybody for three days. And this was a process of preparing. doesn't tell us how long Moses was on the mountain right there. But that would make this the window of Pentecost. If you read 19 verse 1 as being, oh, it's the, the, on the third month, the same day they came out of Egypt, which is the 15th day, then there's no way this could be Pentecost. So I hope that's not over people's heads, but uh, it's just another one of these situations where it kind of helps to clarify with some parentheses so you have an understanding that the on the same day shouldn't have that comma after it. In the third month, on the same day they came to the wilderness of Sinai. So it was the third month after the children of can come out of Egypt. So anyway, enough babbling for me. Christopher, you've got your hand up. Why don't you go ahead and say what you wanted to say? Tom, I have a question. You read this verse before. I don't know where it was at. It was in Acts. And I don't know if it's related to Pentecost. But another portion of the Holy Spirit falls on the people. Can you explain that? I mean, does it relate to Pentecost as well? So you read it to me a while back where they got another outpouring of the Spirit in Acts. Does it relate in any way? Was, this, that, uh, was that when the Gentiles received the Spirit? I think so. I don't know. Is that, you read it in Acts. And okay. I don't know if there's a disciples you got it again. Yeah, or... you know, you know that that verse um, maybe could have been at Pentecost. There's no indication there that that is tied to Pentecost. I mean, I I wouldn't say I'd rule it out, but there's no indication. We don't we know definitely yeah. that the Spirit was poured out at Pentecost, and that's the promise that Yeshua said, "Don't leave Jerusalem." until the promise of the Father is poured out. Because that promise of the Father being poured out, let's, let's talk about that because that's quite interesting. Acts 10.44, by the way, if you want to go there. Acts 10.44, I think um, that's probably what you're referring to. But um, like I say, let's, let's go up with, with what we know for sure. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit, very interesting, uh, the people were coming from all parts of the world. And we could, you guys are familiar with the story, so we don't really need to go back there. They came from all different lands. The Jews were supposed to, the Israelite people were supposed to come back to Jerusalem three times a year. They were doing that still at the time of Yeshua. And they came from all different lands. And the gift of tongues was given to the disciples so that all these people could hear the, the works of God in the sacrifice of Yeshua and the resurrection, uh, basically the gospel. That's what the disciples were preaching at Pentecost. And so if we're looking at that as a type, Yeshua said, when this gospel goes to all the world, then the end will come. So if we can type, uh, if we can attach some typology here, God's first purpose with Pentecost was so that the works of, of Yeshua and the life of Yeshua and the sacrifice of Yeshua would be taken back to the rest of the world where all these people came from. It was the way that God spread the message rather quickly. He chose Pentecost mm -hmm. to pour out his spirit. All the people would come to Jerusalem. They would hear the works, uh, the words of the apostles. And then they would go back and take that message back to the world. So when Paul went later, when Paul went years later, when he went to those churches where all those Jews were, they were ready to hear the message that Paul was preaching. He always went to the Jewish synagogues first. He, he didn't, that wasn't the first time these people heard uh, about Yeshua. But when Paul came, there was harvest. Yeah, he was persecuted, but that groundwork with the disciples at Pentecost really opened the doors for the disciples to take the gospel to the world later uh, because people already heard about it. And, and so that's what God did. So if we're looking at typology with a possibility that the Spirit will be poured out again as it was poured out in Jerusalem, but only this time in the whole world, 
If we go back to Acts chapter 2, let's, let's do that for a moment because I think that's, that would be a good idea. Acts chapter 2. Uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 7, uh, verse 4 tells it, says that they were all filled, and it's interesting, filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, and, and I take that as to be filled, not half filled or whatever. There is a filling of the Holy Spirit. So then it says uh, in verse 5, Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem devout men, Jews, devout men, of every nation under heaven. So there were people, Jews, that had come from all over the then known world. And when this, this sound occurred, the multitude came together and they were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. And I'm not going to get into, you know, whether they heard or whether they spoke the language, that's really almost irrelevant. Um, the fact is, the message went, and they understood it, and they did not know Hebrew, some of these people. So they got a message in their own language that they could understand. Now, it's interesting that Yeshua said the gospel of the kingdom is to go to everyone, all peoples, languages, nations, and tongues. How's he going to do that? I believe... The same way he did the first time, because the first time was just a type. So it, to finish the work, God is going to give the gift of tongues to his people, those that are like, in type, of the 120 in the upper room, and they will go and finish the work of giving the gospel to the whole world. That feast here back in Pentecost was a type, if you will, of the end time, and how do I prove that? If we drop down to verse 14, but Peter standing up with the eleven raised his voice and said to them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. That means pay attention. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. He's quoting Joel now. And he said that it shall come to pass in what days? Last days. Last, last days. Day. Has the last days come to pass yet? No. No, sir. Yeah. No. no. Uh -uh. So Peter applied an end time prophecy in the book of Joe, Joel, and you can go back there, and I would highly recommend it if you haven't read that prophecy in Joel, you want to read back there, and you can see clearly that what Joel talked about did not happen at Pentecost 2,000 years ago. Not in, not in its entirety, but it will happen in the future in its entirety. Let's read what he said was going to happen. It shall come to pass in the last days that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. The purpose of the spirit in the life is to cause us to walk in his statutes and judgments and do them. Why is that so important at the time of the end? Well, this is why it's important in the time of the end. In the time of the end, there's two kingdoms at war. There's the kingdom of light and there's the kingdom of darkness. God has asked those that are of him, those that, are, that want to belong to his kingdom, to represent his kingdom to the world. That means full obedience to his laws because that demonstrates to the world which side we're on. The world is going to be able to make up their minds on which kingdom they want to be a part of because God's people have been filled with the Spirit and they are living in perfect obedience to his laws as a demonstration to the world of which kingdom do you want to be a part of. That's why it's so important that we understand the work of the Spirit as portrayed in Ezekiel 
to cause us to walk in his statutes. Anyone that claims that the Spirit is working in their lives, and I'm not going to mention anyone's names, and if they're not in obedience to God, then it's the wrong spirit. It's the spirit of Antichrist. It's the spirit of disobedience. If God's Spirit is in possession of the life, they will be coming into harmony with God's ways. It's just that simple. That's Bible. And uh, we've got we've to go with what the Bible says on that. So God is going to pour out his spirit on all flesh. And then he says, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. What days? The last days. <laughs> They shall prophesy, I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, fire, or blood and fire, vapor and smoke. You will see an eclipse in the sky, and the, and the sun will turn to darkness, and the moon into blood, before the coming and great and notable day of the Lord. Did I, did I miss something there? I think you added some words there. No eclipse. I think you added eclipse. <laughs> oh, 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 I'm sorry. Oh, I wrote that in in my Bible. Uh, you guys yeah, might you, want to write got, that in. You got a little carried away there. <laughs> I got a little carried away. I'm sorry. I got a little carried away. But did you get the point? Did you get yeah. the point? Yeah. I noticed a lot of people went quiet after that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, that would be called adding to the word. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we don't want to be found doing that. So it says here, to finish it up, no way. it says here, the sun will be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the coming and great and notable day of the Lord. The coming and great and notable day of the Lord is the last day. That's Passover. That's what that's talking about. Pentecost gets us ready for Passover. That's the whole purpose. And you say, well, it's after. Well, yeah. In time, it's after this, but if you complete the cycle and you start here and move forward, Passover is a beginning. It's the beginning of all righteousness. This Amen. gets us yeah. ready for this. That's not the end. It's the beginning for us. It's the new beginning. Passover. What I'm actually saying here is Peter applied an end time prophecy that was for us back in his day. So I don't want anyone to think that Peter was wrong, but Peter was applying prophecy and he was applying the parts of the prophecy that seemed to fit in his day because he believed, actually, not hard to prove, very easy to prove, in fact, that the disciples believed that Yeshua could return any time. He had gone to heaven for a short time, and he was going to return. That was their mentality. So when Yeshua died, and the sun became dark for three hours, he saw fulfillment in Joel's prophecy, and he preached it with all of his heart. And so Peter was right, but he prematurely applied an end-time prophecy. And what happened? What happened? 3,000 people were baptized in one day back there in Jerusalem. Um, and so we see now, 2020 hindsight, when we actually look at this, we can see that all of these specifications in this prophecy were not really fulfilled at Yeshua's first coming and at the Pentecost of the disciples. Therefore, if that's the case, then there has to be a complete fulfillment in the time of the end that every specification actually is fulfilled. Is that clear? Does that make sense to everyone? Yep. Yes, sir. Okay. No. Okay. Um, so, and, and if we want to stop and get some questions, that's good. Uh, no problem. Uh, Christopher, you had a comment. Yeah, I just have a question. So I, I do agree with you that the Passover is when we're going to get delivered. So my question is this, because I haven't really 
found the information. So would you say from Day of Atonement to Passover that there's going to be, is that when the plagues happened? Because uh-huh. everybody in the Ten Commandments makes it seem like it was like a quick lickety split thing and then, you know, Egypt, you know, kicked them out. But if atonement is like five months or whatever before Passover, does that mean that the judgments are going on at that time? I guess that's my question. Okay. Excellent question. You're ahead of us. Uh, you've mm-hmm. been putting some thought into this, obviously. So, so yes, all that, this, and I can't, I can't overemphasize this. Egypt is the pattern of the evidence that I'm presenting here. If we miss the pattern, we won't see where we're going. Unless we look into the past, we can't see where we're going in the future. So that's, that's really what's going on here. So in your question, uh, there's plagues. There would have had to have been some kind of judgment going on. And, and we're getting there because those are the fall festivals. Those are the, the, the typical things that are in the fall festivals. And we're going we're gonna to get there. We're going to completely unpack that. We don't want to go there just yet because we're not quite ready. So I, I hope, Chris, you can hang on to that horse just a little bit that's trying to get out of the gate. I'll call you privately and <laughs> we can discuss it that way. Because I know I'm ahead of some of the folks here. Okay. No, we won't hear it. No, you won't hear it, Rob. It'll be a private discussion. We'll get there next But, <laughs> Rob, if you come up here when Chris calls, you'll hear it with us. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're going to cover that. We're going to cover that because that's all part of the typology in the feast. And once we see the whole system and, and how it plays out, it really starts to uh, make a lot of sense. So, so here we have Pentecost here. So when we look forward to this, we're going to see all these things fulfilled. So I want to look at it again here. So in the last days, verse 17, God's going to pour out his spirit. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. My sons and daughters shall prophesy. Maybe. I don't know. I hope they do. I pray that there's some of these people. Your young men shall see visions. Wonderful. Your old men. Oh, that's where I come into the picture. I might have a dream uh, and dream dreams. Do you, I hope you're seeing that you could read yourself into this. You need to do that. Put your name where it fits here. Because God is calling us to be his representatives and fulfill his purpose on this earth prior to when he comes. And so if we follow on to know him and don't get lost in any discussion and make the first thing the first thing, I think we could be qualified to be these people. We know by Paul in Ephesians that God puts the gifts in the church, the gift of healing, the gift of tongues, the gift of prophecy, the gift of teaching, all these things God is trying to put into his church. Why? Because he wants us to fulfill these roles that he has for his people. I don't know about you, but I would love to be one of these people. But the problem that's going to come with this is uh, a little bit of uh, targeting, as in persecution. But you know what? It's all going to be worth it. So, um, so let's put ourselves into here. Uh, I'm going to put myself, because I've got a little bit of gray hair, I'm going to put myself into this old men will dream dreams. Right. Having a question. Tom? Yes. Question? Is, would these be the, um, possibly be the 144,000 people in the end time that they're speaking of? It's, it's very likely that most of what we're seeing right here will be the 144,000, just as in the 120 in the upper room. The 120 in the upper room had the full measure of the Spirit poured out on them. And then they went and shared it with those of the world. In this, 
at this Pentecost, on the final Pentecost, God's Spirit will be poured out and this will happen. And they will go from here, from Pentecost, into the fall feast, and they will go into all the world and finish the work of preaching the gospel. And all those that will be saved after this are the fulfillment of all those that went into the world at that point as well. All of this stuff has greater fulfillment, and they're, they're to show us, really, God's trying to reveal to us what his plan is in, in the future. That's what uh, he's going to do. Great. I have a question. Great question, Sherry. No, that was Kathleen. Oh, thank you. Okay, That's Kathleen has a question. Yes, please. Go for it. On, on first fruits, do you think that that is when our resurrection, or I mean, if we're dead, you know, that would be our resurrection, or that would be uh, when we will. Uh, meet him in the air. Yes. Um, or do you think it's Passover, uh, you know, Passover that night uh, when he's crucified? It, it's first fruits is the feast where there's a resurrection. So That's what I was thinking. Uh, uh, it has to be. It has to be. It's the only feast that has a resurrection tied to it. And mm -hmm. Yeshua was, was a demonstration of that. Uh, at, at the beginning, it was a wave sheaf of barley that what happened was the seed originally was planted into the soil and had to die. That's that seed that goes into the ground and dies and comes up as a greater harvest. That's typical of the resurrection. So when Yeshua, that seed in Yeshua, the seed of promise, died and went into the ground, he produced a larger harvest when he came out of the ground in the resurrection of the many, it talks about in Matthew 27. That is all typical of the greater harvest, the ultimate harvest of the righteous in the time of the end. Absolutely. Um, okay. Yeah, that's, I, that's yeah, what I, I believe. I, yeah, I just, it, it just, because every time I hear, you know, anyone telling you that, uh, the resurrection or the, you know, the second coming would be Passover, Passover. But it t in all reality, it's actually first fruits. The uh, resurrection, you know. yes. But the Passover is when God's people on earth are delivered and the resurrection will follow. And I'm going to, I'm going to try and demonstrate that we're not going to have According to the prophecies, according to the timeline, the 1260, 1290, 1335, I think it yes. can be demonstrated that we're going to have a Passover day. And they were delivered actually from Egypt on first fruits, which went into uh, the, uh, they were delivered from Egypt and then first fruits would follow right on the heels of that. So we're not going to have like four or five days like in the time of Yeshua. We're going to have it right on the heels. And this is what the prophecies seem to indicate in the timing of the 1260, 1290, and 1335. We're going to get there. Um, we're not going to look at that tonight. But it's not going to be days apart. First fruits is not going to be four or five days after. That whole schedule is going to be tightened right up. Uh, and, and like Yeshua said, unless those days are shortened, the only way that we can have a Passover deliverance and a first fruits following right on the heels, if it's a tight Passover schedule and you can do it. And we're going to show you how you can do it. Um, okay. Get there. <laughs> All right. Yeah. 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 In the meantime, I'll wait. <laughs> okay, well, it's not, uh, it, it won't be too long. I'm not sure when we'll, we'll actually get there, but uh, we'll, we'll look at a little bit of that. We've got a few more minutes tonight. We'll, we'll, we'll give you a little bit of a heads up as to where we're, we're going here as well. So uh, any other comments or questions, clarifications? i got a question, Tom. Yeah. Um, kind of related to your Shabbat teaching on the millennium, you know, with the child will 
um, not die, killer hunter and all so forth. Uh, one right. thing I'm kind of learning from you that I didn't sort of really put together before, I was just making sure I got this right. The resurrection is different than eternity, right? Because when we resurrect, we go to the Father's house, and then we go into eternity. So that really made a difference. And I'm just going to talk to you a little bit after this about it. But but this is kind of related. You were talking about the resurrection. Yeah. So that really sense and boy there's some kind of neat things i got out of that and i'll talk to you about that later yeah yeah no it is when when we start to see the reality of this at the resurrection there's a thousand year period and actually technically and I, and i have to be careful how i say this because we have eternal life right now my eternal life yeah. has started i haven't been glorified yeah. yet but as long as i stay with him i have eternal life i'm not going to lose it but it's a choice. Every day it's a choice. It's sometimes it's a minute by minute choice. But it's eternal. My eternal life can start now. But my glorification does not happen until the second coming. That's another phase in the plan of salvation. But that's not where it ends. There's still another thousand years that I'm going to be under the teaching, direct teaching of Yeshua and the Father in his kingdom. And then we come back to this world. In my mind, that's not that. That is when the real eternity starts, when we have a new heaven and a new earth. We have eternal life all the way through, uh, but the reality, the completion of the plan of salvation, does not happen until we have a new heaven and a new earth. And that does not happen until the end of the thousand years, according to the book of Revelation. Yeah, makes sense. So, yeah. So that's where I think we're going to have some real major surprises in store for us, because we have no clue what that's going to be like. Uh, we can only dream about that part. So, yeah, that's right. yeah, yeah. I think because, it's going to be far more glorious than what we can even imagine. Yeah, I think so. Well, it's kind of amazing because in Christianity, you know, you kind of think of resurrection, that's it, we're in eternity from there on, or some people think you go right into the millennium, you know, on earth and all that. But right. It's, no, it's so just yeah. going to get better and uh, better all the time. Yeah. Yeah, the more I'm learning from your teachings, the more it makes sense. Because when you first hear it, you're like, no, no, no. <laughs> and last, the last one we... That really sort of just clicked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We well, just gotta just gotta stay with it, and and it has to make sense. It has to make sense with the word. If it doesn't make sense with the word, that's where we gotta stop. So we just you keep. What, uh, so I'll talk to you afterwards because I don't want to get off topic. But uh, that marriage, uh, you know, the child having children in the uh, in eternity. I'll talk to you about that. that's very interesting. Yeah, I'll okay. tell you my that afterwards because I don't want to distract from this. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to see what you want to talk about. <laughs> yeah, well let's let's do that after and um and we can we can move on here. Any other questions uh or comments or uh anything that before we move forward here? Okay, so what we'll do next week is we'll go from Pentecost and we're going to build the last year, the last cycle of the feasts. Now, what are the feasts for? Let's have some ideas out here. What are the feasts for? And there's a number of reasons, so not any of these answers are going to be wrong. Um, the gospel. The gospel, they all teach. All the feasts are the gospel of Messiah from creation all the way to the end is what I see. Okay, the feasts are the gospel. The Sabbath is for creation and to remember it and then everything else falls right in line about Messiah. Good. You know? Okay, so the feasts are, are the gospel. And to just expand on that is, yeah, they're the gospel, but they, they're the prophecy the, the prophecy of the pinnacle events of the plan of salvation. They all have a little different meaning 
They all have a little different purpose, and together they tell a complete story. So that's what we're trying to unpack here. If the festivals are for pinnacle events in the plan of salvation, the pinnacle events in the plan of salvation, uh, at least a good deal of them, are prior to when Yeshua returns. He's going to be our deliverer at Passover, so we have to have some kind of fulfillment for the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and also as we're looking at Pentecost as well, we'll play into this. Also, trumpets and the Day of Atonement and the Feast of Tabernacles will also play into the last year of the cycle. Many people believe that it's just the last three in the year, trumpets, uh, Day of Atonement, and Tabernacles, are the only feasts that are going to be fulfilled as yet. Uh, but we're learning, no, no, the, the whole festival calendar is in play in the time of the end. And we're going to look at the, the way that the last cycle, last yearly cycle will happen. So we see the plan of salvation in the feast. What else do we see in the feast? What other purpose does God have in the feast? Like I say, there's probably no wrong answers here. Just to meet uh, as a fellowship gathering. Good. They're called holy convocations. So there are times when the body comes together and they fellowship together, they learn together. Um, and uh, the Father meets with them through his Spirit. So it's a, a learning experience. It's a bonding experience. All of this is, is part of it. Right. And they also have a building up experience. I don't know if you've noticed, but when you rub shoulders with people, when you start to really rub shoulders with people, uh, you start to get to know them. And you start to get to know that, oh, they weren't as perfect. The closer we come to each other, the more we're going to see that none of us are perfect. Well, that's a revelation, and it should be a revelation of what? It should be a revelation that we start to do the work that the Father's given us to do. And that work is not to tear each other down when we see a defect, but to build each other up. That's what the feasts are about. That's why they're called holy convocations. We come together for a holy, pur a holy purpose, and that purpose is to build each other up into the most holy faith. That's why, that's what we do. That's why when we have a problem amongst us, we don't just run away and throw up our hands and get mad. We come together and we try and work it out. And that's what we need to do. And that's, we need to, we need to learn those lessons. It's, it's not about tearing down, it's about building up. That's what God's plan is. And that's what the, the purpose in the feasts are. So we help each other. And, and Judy and I, we came to that understanding that when we have a challenge, something that we don't see eye to eye with, the easiest thing for a person to do is just to get... That never happens. That never happens. <laughs> but we realize the reason why we've been brought together is so that we can help each other arrive at the final destination. You know, a husband and wife, back in the very beginning when Adam was given a helper... That, was, that would have been really neat to have a helper when there was no sin. But I tell you what, when there's sin, we need a helper more than we can even imagine. And so as husbands and wives, when we come together and we actually understand God's plan for us, we become helpmates for each other in our struggle in this life so that we can attain the life to come. And the body is the same thing. We help each other. We bear each other's burdens so that we can all arrive at our final destination. And so the feast, the one of the primary focuses that God is, has given us to focus on is to build each other up, just like the husband and wife, just like the parents for the children, to build their children up so that they can be representatives of God's kingdom. So um, 
so I think we'll, we'll leave it on that note. And uh, if we have any questions uh, or things that you, go, you guys want to talk about, about these feasts, and uh, we'll be dealing with trumpets, Day of Atonement, and Tabernacles next week and pull it all together to show us how the last year, year uh, on this, in this world will be played out according to the festival calendar. Also, we may not get to it, but we'll be c combining that with the prophecies as well, the number days, the 2300, the 1260, 1335, 1290, um, and tie those in. <laughs> that demonstrate that we will be operating on a festival calendar in the time of the end. Yeah. Beautiful. Let's, uh, let's have prayer, and then uh, we'll open it up for any discussion, or uh, some of you guys on a different time schedule and might be wanting to take a nap about now. So, <laughs> Father, we come before you again thanking you for your word. And Father, we ask that you would lead us, continue to lead us and guide us into all truth and show us things to come. Father, we look forward to the promises of the gospel, which is tied up in the festival calendar. And Father, we want you to pour out your spirit on us. We ask that you prepare us for that day. We ask you to be with us now, be with our families. May we be a light to those around us to represent you and your kingdom, we pray in Yeshua's name. Amen.